Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow. Welcome to Paranormal Yakker. My guest today is psychic detective Noreen Rainier. Uh, she is the only psychic ever to lecture at the FBI Academy and has assisted law enforcement officials all over the world, working on over 400 criminal cases. Noreen Rainier, Welcome to Paranormal Yakker. A pleasure to be here. Uh, when did you first realize, Noreen, that by blending, by meshing your psychic gifts with your innate investigative skills, you could help distort clients and police who found themselves hitting a brick wall with dead end cases? It was about 40 some years ago. I was a bit skeptical, so I liked the police because they were skeptical too. I really wanted this skepticism because I was not a total believer in the beginning. And uh, I accidentally got involved in it. And I remember, I think that one of the early ones was a homicide. And because I still had doubts, I, I made myself feel the pain of the person being killed. And that went on for years. I could, I've been shot with a shotgun and I've been a male and male parts. I've, I've had my throat slit many times, stabbed in the head. Uh, and, and for some reason, while I'm in this sort of trance state, uh, I don't get upset. But later, if I hear my tape of my uh, sessions, which I taped everything, and lots of times we transcribe the tapes, uh, I, I would get upset. Uh, but it came accidentally, and then I think one detective talked to another, and then another talked to another, and very early on, I was lecturing uh, for the FBI, and that gave me uh, exposure to a lot of men all over the United States. Uh, how did law enforcement officers initially react to you being brought in to help them solve uh, unsolved cases. I'm sure, okay. at least in the beginning, there was reluctance by some uh, to use the services of a psychic. Well, in the beginning, no, I was lucky. The or I think if they had been mean or really skeptical, now I've had my skeptical cops in, in that lifetime, but in the beginning, they just wanted to solve the crime. And they had heard that I had worked on this other crime. So they were all gun ho look, we just want to solve the crime. If she uses, you know, what, whatever method we don't care if we're successful and i i was good uh and right from the beginning we clicked because i liked their skepticism that that they and, and then they were teaching me because i had never worked with the police i mean all my in, in encounters were maybe a, a a speeding ticket i mean i had no and i didn't read mystery books i mean i i had two kids i was bringing up uh by myself so it it, it was a totally new world for me to step into uh and, and I liked it and they liked me and they, and they could tell that I was being honest and real because they were used to people lying to them. That's good to hear. Uh, what was the breakthrough moment, the first case you helped police solve that gave wider acceptance to your abilities in the eyes of law enforcement? It was a, a, a rape case in, uh, I believe, in Virginia. Uh, he uh, was a serial rapist uh, and I... I uh, wasn't, I, I was lecturing uh, to, uh, I was teaching at the time at the University of Virginia of all things, I could barely spell psychic phenomena, uh, but somehow they, they hired me to teach uh, ESP class and really I, I was learning myself at that time, uh, but I was lecturing outside of it at another college uh, and they asked me, the audience, somebody in the audience asked me about the rapist and I started giving information, which nowadays I wouldn't do at all because who knows what I'm picking up from where, but in those I was ignorant slash innocent. Uh, and they took that information, they tape recorded it and there was also a newspaper man there, uh, but the family, they tape recorded it, gave it to the police and the police agreed to meet with me. And we met at one of the victim's homes, which I, I do most of my 90% of my work over the phone now, but then I went to the home and described the bad guy and how he stuttered and apologized to his victim. And she kept nodding and, and they were really pleased. Uh, and just before we left, uh, they asked me one question, when we, will we catch him? When will we make an arrest? And I 
just off the top of my head, I told them when I saw, which turned out to be accurate. And they were kind enough to come back and tell me about my accuracy, how the rapist did have the bad leg, how his mother worked in a restaurant. How So that was the first time I, I had worked with the police. The first time people gave me feedback. Now, after that, the police lots of times don't give me feedback because they don't want me to take any and I don't solve crimes. I really don't. The police do. Uh, I just am sort of another tool for the long arm of the law. Psychometry and remote viewing are two of the tools you use in your psychic investigations. In what manner do you employ them? Oh, I love psychometry. I, I just get so much from touching uh, a, a bloody object or an object that the person wore. Uh, and, and then I see, let's take a homicide and I'm holding glasses. Uh, I can see what she saw, but once she's dead, I can't see anymore from her eyes. So I have to switch to Noreen. But psychometry, uh, to me, tells me so much. I've had artifacts uh, from the past that I've been able to touch and describe. I remember a museum one time hiring me because they had found this painting and they didn't know who the artist was. So uh, they wouldn't let me touch, touch the painting, but I could make passes over it. And I described the man and how he, what, what he wore, what century, they knew what century I was talking about when I described his uh, you know, fluffy shirt and everything about him that I knew immediately who I was talking about. So psychometry is, is my, my favorite. I, I like that. Remote viewing, I have to do mostly with missing children or missing people because they have nothing to touch or, or the crime homicides are much easier for me. And since I have no memory, I, I don't get upset at that time. Uh, Later, I might. I think burning. I, I think I was burned once, which was the worst, worst death I had. The, the burning. We had to stop the session, and I was crying and screaming, and because uh, I really feel the pain of the victim, which I I try to stop over the years, not not do it, and sort of try to watch it, uh, but it's hard. It's hard. Predicted the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. When did you make that prediction and how did that premonition come about? It was the second time I had lectured at the academy. Uh, earlier, I had lectured to a class of uh, agents and in those days they were mostly men. Uh, I, I don't remember seeing a woman, but it was like 35 in a class and, and do all that. And then I uh, remember uh, maybe a couple of times I did the lecture in the class and one man after the class came up to me and he said, I don't believe a word you said prove it to me. So nowadays I would say, well, tough noodles, I don't care. But then I was at the FBI Academy, I was teaching. So I held his watch and I thought, oh my God, I've, I've got to be good, I've got to be good. And I remember seeing his back and I saw a scar shaped like a cross. And he would go, no, no, anything I said. But the men took him in the back of the room and lifted up his shirt. And there was a scar shaped like a cross on his back. And then he confessed everything else I said. So uh, then the next lecture was in an auditorium about like 350 men in there. And I'm lecturing. Uh, in fact, the same thing happened there. After the lecture, oh, during the lecture, somebody asked me about Reagan. And how he's going to do is going to be very popular. But then I remember putting my hands to my chest and saying, but he's going to be injured. He's going to come from outside and it's going to be at this time. And uh, I told him, and then all of a sudden I'm interrupted and somebody else wants something else. Another question. And then finally the man in the back, they're always in the back of the room, man in the back of the room stood up and he said, I don't believe a word you said. If you could do what you say, tell me who, how so-and-so died, Bobby died. I mean, it's not really the name, but Bobby died. Sure. So again, I'm good at praying. Oh God, let me be right, let me be right. So I tried to tune into Bobby and I could see he died a very uh, torturous death. Uh, I said he was a friend of his son's uh, and he lived close by to the officer and his family and described, I forgot everything, I think it's in one of my books. Uh, uh, and, and the man was holding an unlit cigar. So he crushed the cigar, threw it on the ground and stormed off. And the FBI agent came on the stage and said, who Noreen just described with Gacy. Uh, he ch killed, uh, it was a serial killer of young children and he always tortured them uh, before death. So that, 
that, that I, I went outside the answer, but sort of tells you. Yeah, I, I'm glad you did. Uh, the uh, Lacey Peterson murder was in the headlines for a long time, and you, Noreen, provided police with vital information about the case. Or what were the circumstances surrounding your involvement? Mother called me and wanted to hire me. Oh, she wrote a check. I don't know why, but somehow I lowered my fee for her. Uh, and I never copied checks I got, uh, but for some reason I copied her check. Later she denied, uh, uh, and I told her, I said, I needed something that Lacey wore a great deal so I could psychometrize it. I was uh, I was not, uh, not going to touch Scott. I was going to just find where the body was. I was going to program my mind, just find the body. Don't be concerned who did it. Uh, so I was going to program my mind. Well, what Scott sent me was a big t-shirt of Lacey, which I think she, if she wore it at all, there was no, no vibes. Uh, I mean, very little vibes. So I was calling his mother, I thought, and I got Scott on the phone and I, went, and I could tell right away his mind was just being protected it was shutting down on me and I said Scott I'm so sorry about your wife uh, and I appreciate you sending me the big t-shirt but I need something that she wore more do you have uh, the police told me was, he said oh, we don't have any the police took a lot I said a toothbrush hairbrush no the police took I said the police said you had a lot of shoes could you send me a pair of her shoes so I thought that I would get vibes in there again. But what he didn't realize he did, he wrote in his own handwriting, my address on the envelope, his return address. So all I did was touch his handwriting. And that's when I, uh, and we send it to, I had a, usually I work with the police, but the police said, cuts this is so high profile, we can't work with you, but we'll listen to everything, anything you give us. So I hired us, uh, not hired, I had a parapsychologist from up north uh, question me, because I need to be questioned. Um, so the police had trained me enough that we'll ask you a question, you tell us the answer. Uh, so I was real good at d doing that. Uh, so she questioned me a lot. We she tape recorded it and then transcribed it and sent it to the police. And then we did send it to the mother later. And we tried to take out anything that Scott was mentioned in, but uh, I did lead them. And I had never been in that part of the country, and neither had it was in Modesta, and neither had the girl. So I had to leave from their place and try to drive them, go through the construction. Then when there's a water, that this and and I, I don't remember everything. I think it's in my book, uh, A Mind for Murder. Yes, and the beautiful uh, segue right now, because that's what I want to speak to you next about in your book, A Mind for Murder. The real life files of a psychic investigator. You give a true account of your remarkable life and career, included are stories about your prediction of the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan and your involvement in the Lacey Peterson murder, both of which we uh, spoke about. Uh, but you also include a number of other fascinating, literally jaw dropping stories, uh, such as having a client who is a professional mercenary. Can you expand on that story? Uh, this was very early in my career uh, and I was seeing people. I lived in Virginia uh, uh, and, and people in those days, uh, I didn't do it over the phone. I think I started there doing it over the phone, but I people would just come in uh, and remember this uh, sort, of, uh, sort of little tough a uh, rough guy coming in and asking me questions about his, will I be safe? Will I have a, 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 a safe, it, it meant safe was a lot of important. Uh, the questions were sort of weird uh, that he asked, but, the, and then he would come back and say, yes, you were right. Uh, this happened, the camp trip was canceled, but yes, I, I was, uh, this, this is, and then he would ask for another reading and he was going someplace else. And he claimed he was a contractor. It was in construction or contract for the uh, did all over all of the world, I guess. Uh, but I'm trying to think how how I knew that he oh oh wow oh he got drunk one night. I think this is it, and he called me, and he oh said he was the prince of 
death or darkness. I forgot all that, but he sort of told me about, uh, 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 he, he was drunk and he was confirming uh, uh, the trip, but he was also telling me about himself. But I really forgot, I think I pushed that one really back, uh, really back. But he, he was an assassin. That's what he was doing, coming to me before each killing and making sure that the end, he wanted me to see always the end result. And the last time, of course, he got caught, I think it was in uh, Qaddafi's area. I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred, we should read the book. I should have read that chapter. Darn, I'm sorry. Well, I want our viewers to view the book and all know about that, that we're just touching on it. I mean, all of your stories are just incredible. And in your book, The Practical Psychic, A No-Nonsense Guide to Developing Your Natural Intuitive Abilities, you provide instructions how anyone can develop and use their psychic abilities to enrich their everyday life. This includes exercises and meditations. Can you share one or two of the exercises you recommend? Well, first off, uh, at the beginning, I thought maybe I was special. And then I realized I, I'm not special. I, I, everyone could do to some extent, it's like art. Uh, I can't draw, uh, but people claim anybody can draw or play musical instruments. I have bad ears, so I I, I, I can't sing. Uh, I can dance, but I can't sing. Uh, uh, but everyone has this ability to some extent, some greater than others, sort of like an athletes and all. And so I, uh, when I, at the University of Virginia, when I started teaching, uh, I realized that everything first number one is, is energy. Uh, and, and if we learned how to interpret energy, uh, and when Ian Stevenson, who was very much into reincarnation, he was out of, of um, the county, uh, out of the uh, states when I was hired. Otherwise, I would have never been hired uh, because he just didn't believe in psychics. Uh, and my class was, uh, was going to say uh, development. Or, he said, no, you can't tell people you could develop them. I said, but I can, I can. He said, no, you can't tell people. You're going to, your class should be called ESP and an awareness. So I started, so our class is really just games. I tell them to leave their logical mind at the door and we just play these games because we're so taught by society to use our logical, rational thinking mind. The other hemisphere, that's what gets us in trouble. That's why psychiatrists are busy because the emotional side is, is not paid as much attention to, certainly, 50 years ago when I was starting to teach and all, uh, it, it was more ignored. But now they have mindful meditation uh, and meditation because uh, we have right brain, left brain thinking. We, we cross over uh, accidentally sometimes, certainly in dreams, people uh, have these wonderful dreams because they've let down all their defenses. Uh, but uh, I was trying to teach them how to use the other hemisphere of the mind. Uh, Oh dear, I'm just sort of going on and on. And now I, I, I let me just breathe. I get excited very easily. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. No, 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 not at all. So when I teach it, psychic abilities, uh, well, I'm not teaching them. I'm making them aware of what they already have. And I think through meditation of calming ourselves and focusing on other aspects, uh, uh, it, it opens up the mind a great deal. Uh, I, I'm not saying that very cleverly. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's very clear what you're saying. No, it makes a lot of sense what you were saying and letting people realize it's all within them. They have that ability. They just have to accept it and develop it and focus on that. Now, I have a question for you related to a lot of the things you told me during our interview. If I'm wrong about this, tell me. But I would say that you are an empath. Uh, because we're saying with the fire and different things that you pick up. My question to you is, and I'm always curious when I speak to people who are empaths and picking that up, how do you deal with that? Especially say when you're in a, a crowd and you don't know who's what, what vibes are coming there and you pick up on that. How do you deal with that? It, it's difficult. It was difficult before I knew I was psychic. I just never liked crowded malls. I was just like the little tiny stores that very few people were in, uh, but I didn't know what it was all about. And then e even as a psychic, I, I again didn't realize how much people were affecting me. Uh, so I, I am a loner. Uh, I am a loner. I, li I like maybe more one-on-one. -on -one. I don't mind lecturing because I'm I'm not that close. I'm on a, on a stage. I, I like that. 
uh, but to be in crowds, uh, I, I couldn't handle it. Uh, I, I just can't. Uh, so I definitely prefer being, I love being alone. I really do. I love, I used to have a log cabin and I had 20 acres and everybody else around me had hundreds. So we had the animals and all the time I would have people is if I went out and I could choose when to go out and, and I love, I love living out there. Yes. Yeah, I just had to ask you that question for the saying because it had to be so difficult to deal with, but obviously you did. Um, uh, should viewers of Paranormal Yacker want to order your books, employ your services, learn about your lectures? What is your contact information? I have a, a website called uh, you know, all the W's, uh, NoreenRenier.com. I'm not doing private readings anymore. Really ancient, you know, I'm 84 now. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm still alive. Uh, so, uh, but I am lecturing and I am teaching. I might be teaching some police. Uh, I won't say where yet, how to develop their own ability, which is my goal. Uh, we don't only need a few. We don't need the whole whole squad. We just need a special team to do what I can do, certainly on missing children, crimes that, that they need help right away. If they had their own special people inside doing it, uh, it, it would make easier so I, I, I end up teaching the police but I'm not doing private readings but my books I, I want them to grow and learn and I'm very honest so I think I, I've showed as much as I know the truth. Noreen Renier I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yacker I wish you much success not just with your books but with the amazing work you're doing as a psychic detective. Thank you I really appreciate that thank you. This has been a wonderful interview and God bless. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you don't miss any interviews on my free YouTube channel, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.